My name is Taruna Naidu and I'm joined by uh, Andrew King, a director in our advisory practice. So welcome, Andrew, who's going to talk to us about the very relevant topic of balance sheet resilience. Now, Andrew, companies are currently going through quite a tough economic climate. I think from our 26th uh, annual CEO survey, which was released in the middle of January, uh, we saw that 73% of CEOs are effectively saying that they expect a decline in terms of uh, economic growth in the next 12 months. And I think, you know, unfortunately, it's the most pessimistic outlook that we've had in, in almost a decade. So I want to talk a little bit about how focusing on the balance sheet can really allow businesses to thrive um, in these challenging times. But, but maybe to kick us off, Andrew, what do we really mean by balance sheet resilience? Yeah, thanks, Tarina. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the current economic conditions that we're in at the moment are unprecedented across the patch. So we've got a high inflationary environment, high salary costs, high commodity costs, high interest costs. And when you overlay that with the global macroeconomic trends that are currently impacting the world around geopolitical tensions, uh, demographic, demographic shifts, uh, and the like, and climate change, you put all those together and the path is increasingly uncertain for, for businesses going forward. And the balance sheet can either be used as a, a basis for strength and agility through this, these tough times, or it can be a drag. Uh, and certainly we see the balance sheet, uh, a resilient balance sheet being a, uh, a balance sheet that has a capital structure that is fit for purpose for both business and strategic needs that evolves over time. Capital has been allocated appropriately to assets that are returning yields higher than the weighted average cost of capital. And ultimately, there are mechanisms in, mechanisms in place that protect the ecosystem surrounding the balance sheet, including liquidity monitoring, forecasting, uh, performance management, uh, and uh, business recovery, disaster recovery plans as well. So, I mean, Andrew, you've given us some really good examples of, of you know, the positives that we would expect to see, but, but what does an unhealthy balance sheet look like and how do we identify that? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, over time, the balance sheet, it's a bit of a slow poison sometimes. Even though you're looking at a, a balance sheet, the, it can deteriorate quite slowly over time. And what we see in practice is that often management teams look to solve the, the almost the symptoms rather than the root causes. So, for example, if you have a liquidity squeeze, you may look to cut headcount, uh, get additional funding in place, uh, shift out maintenance capex. But all of those give short-term gains for longer-term potential negative impacts mm. instead of focusing on the root cause, which may be margin erosion or you know returns not yielding uh, the, the, what they should be. So um, it's, it's very much a case of looking at how, looking at that proactively uh, and looking at metrics such as liquidity and solvency ratios, mm -hmm. as well as leverage ratios. And looking that at, at that return on invested capital versus your WAC. Mm -hmm. And it's important that that's considered over time and not at a point in time because one can get misleading indications at a point in time. So you need, to all the, you need all the data points to understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very much a case of you know, looking at that on a holistic basis and making sure that um, you also embed those, those into existing processes. So mm -hmm. for example, you, you're doing going concern reviews in any event as a business as required. So why not embed that into those processes yeah. on an ongoing basis? You know, businesses often have financial covenants in the existing debt agreements. So that's also a way of measuring, uh, measuring balance sheets and business performance and health against existing processes and metrics, which can give you a bit of an early warning mechanism and trigger mm -hmm. in relation to that. So it's, it's not trying to reinvent the wheel but trying to work within the, the ambit of the business uh, and some of the processes already in place to actually yield and, and identify those particular issues early on. Absolutely. So, I mean, if we focus on the positives and I guess some of the practical steps that organizations can take, what can they do to kind of build a more resilient balance? Yeah. So the capital structure is, is a good place to start. So uh, certainly looking at your borrowing, borrowing structure. So over time, businesses obviously go on a bit of an evolution, either to growth or demise. And uh, you need to cons consistently look at whether those borrowing facilities are fit for purpose. So you look at your long-term versus short-term splits. Uh, are they, have they been used for appropriate uses? So is your long-term funding for long-term assets? Is your short-term funding for short-term assets? You know, ha is there complexity, un you know, unnecessary complexity in the group, mm. in different parts of the group? Uh, is, are there lots of synd syndication of lenders or are there only bilateral relationships in place? What are the nature of those instruments? Were they fit for purpose on a legacy basis? So maybe you're in a high growth venture capital type environment with high risk. So therefore paying higher higher pricing 
and now you've moved into maybe more of a mature phase where you can actually look at the refinancing and and uh, based on the latest credit metrics. So it's it's very much looking at a fit for purpose position mm -hmm. at present, but also aligned to your strategic objectives going forward. Uh, it's also around. I want to say some of the softer things as well. It's around management skills and capacity within the business to not only run the business, but also apply the judgment calls in terms of prioritizing uh, particular actions to take where one identifies root cause uh, issues. Uh, it's looking at uh, your uh, liquidity processes, so treasury management, understanding whether that's being managed appropriately and whether that can be optimized. Uh, it's looking at KPIs to uh, allocate responsibility and accountability to actually drive business performance. So I think that's key critical and often something that you, know, you look at top line revenue growth, but not necessarily look at cash metrics and, and how that sort of translates through the, through the cycle. So very important to develop uh, sustainably on that basis. And then also management teams should look to uh, sensitize and develop scenario analysis of the business for, for stress scenarios so that you can actually see just from a risk appetite perspective, where you can potentially tweak or move things or optimize a business for for a buffer and for resilience going forward. So those are some of the options. And there's also, I mean, the, the getting an independent pair of eyes in, in, in there is also important. So whether if you're part of a wider group and, you know, maybe some other people from other parts of the group could come in and look at the business on an independent basis, turn over the rocks, understand the root cause, or you could get an independent advisor to do that. But sometimes... People are so embedded that mm. you can't see the wood through the trees. Yeah, you need that bird's eye view and just to step back and get a fresh pair of eyes. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And it isn't sort of a, it's horses for courses ultimately. Yeah. But there's a lot of easy wins as well. Mm. And and I like your reflection on the scenario planning. I'm sure that's something COVID also taught us. Absolutely. Right? That, that <laughs> we've got to be able to anticipate the, the unexpected. And the thing is, you, you don't know what the unexpected is by definition. So you, you've got to build in enough tolerance for shock events and for business as usual. Yeah. And that's, that's very important. Mm. And, and Andrew, I mean, I think a lot of the focus at the moment is obviously on funding now, right? Um, the sources of funding, you know, particularly difficult. I'm sure many investors are very risk averse at the moment. Um, so help organizations understand, you know, where do you really obtain this funding yeah. and, and what are some of the considerations when you, um, you know, going about uh, approaching investors uh, yeah. with respect to funding? Yeah, it's an interesting one because there's, there's actually a lot of capital available and dry powder available, but from a, a risk aversion perspective, they, there's less inclination to just lend willy-nilly to the, to the market. So uh, we're seeing that not only in certain industries, but actually across the patch. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's very much a case of those funders and industries also looking to build sufficient buffer for shock events that, that they may experience. Right. So it's, um, you know, it's a combination of a couple of things, but certainly the easiest low hanging, hanging fruit is to actually look internally at whether one can optimize the existing asset base uh, and operations because it, it's there. Yeah. So, and it's generally the lowest, uh, lowest cost of funding to actually look internally and optimize. So it's things like op the optimizing your working capital cycle, accelerating cash conversion on a, on a sustainable basis. Mm -hmm. So whether that's negotiating with creditors to extend credit terms looking at various uh, alternative mechanisms to accelerate your data collection, mm -hmm. just in time mechanisms around uh, inventory. And there'll be different methods for different industries, obviously. But uh, doing that or looking at uh, ops uh, ops pieces, I mean, Emma, my colleague spoke around operational resilience and, and how one can look internally around, you know, revenue growth, uh, cost optimization on a sustainable basis. And mm -hmm. all of that is incremental to balance sheet health as well. Now, what that does in terms of unlocking additional liquidity is it may cost a little bit up front, mm -hmm. but the upside potential is massive. And what it does do is it opens up optionality for other third party funding options because by increasing your cash flows, mm. your metrics, credit metrics are better. Absolutely. So it's, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. So mm -hmm. look internally first is, is, is the way to go. Then it's looking at your existing funding relationships. So it's your transactional bankers, existing funders into the business, funders that you may know as part of a wider ecosystem and network of relationships that you've built over time. Mm. And often those those relationships, having them know more about the business, either directly or indirectly, can help the appetite mm. from a from a ex, uh, extending credit risk perspective. So I think that's, that's important. But conversely, people get quite comfortable with their existing relationships and mm -hmm. they 
they're not funders are not always independent because they're selling a product. Mm. So it's important to also keep them honest by looking at other options, other funders in the market, running competitive processes that can yield both commercial and non-commercial benefits for businesses uh, over time. And it's an evolution. Uh, you, mm. you know, a, a fit for purpose structure right now is, is something that may not be fit for purpose in a couple of years. So it's a constant evolution and, and, and recheck and check. And uh, so it, it's, it's, it's something that has to be done over time and it has to be done holistically. One can also look at uh, ESG sustainability linked loans, which is massively topical at mm. the moment. Still very new yeah. in South Africa. So it's, it's uh, in fact, Center Bank did their first sustainability linked loan in the last three or four weeks. Yeah. So very, um, very topical. Uh, I think the lenders and funders and business are still trying to come to terms of what that actually means. Right. But ultimately, it's a massive source of capital that's going to just get bigger going forward. Mm. And typically a lot cheaper because it supports ESG metrics on the funder side as well as the business side. Absolutely. And normally there's ratchets that are built in mm. to actually support further reduction in, in pricing terms mm. if one hits certain metrics. Yeah. So that's a, that's a massive uh, opportunity for businesses and should be looked into. Uh, and and one has to embed ESG into everything we do. It's not a, it's not a bolt on anymore, right? Mm. It used to no, be so much strategy. Exactly, part. yeah, exactly. And um, you know, especially in environments where there's increasing shareholder, uh, you know, risk appetites elements mm. around that. I mean, and uh, shareholder activists in in relation to that. Absolutely, you, you're going to have to be on board and be proactive in on mm. that basis. And then in terms of equity considerations, there's. I mean, it goes without saying that one needs to look at whether a strategic partner coming in or more of a passive partner is fit for purpose for a business. Yeah. Some businesses function a lot better on a more an autonomous basis. Yeah. Some some need that strategic uh, partnership in a in an industry almost as an SME type type basis to yeah. to lend support, uh, not only funding, uh, but it's you know it's looking beyond that as well. I mean, we've seen a lot of instances in the market where equity providers have actually stripped cash out of businesses through dividends mm. and although you tick the solvency and liquidity boxes from a regulatory perspective as required in, in the companies act for example mm. there's not enough buffer that's built in for normal business needs within the business um, and for shock events mm. and often that those dividends that go upwards to at that point when that's maybe needed in terms of support for shareholders uh, for sh subsidiaries mm. that cash is often trapped up in other assets Right. So we've seen a lot of instances where subsidiaries are stranded and having to get unsustainable funding and the like in, mm. in place. Again, short term, short term actions, but with longer term negative impacts. So, so yeah, quite quite a complex environment. Mm. But uh, but there are alternatives to explore. Yeah, and it's positive to hear that there are that many alternatives. Yeah. You know, uh, companies have to really just um, understand the opportunity. Exactly, and it's about being proactive. I mean, that's the thing, not being reactive to stuff. And the and we mm. talked about the demise curve in previous sessions. The earlier one identifies yeah. issues or, or potential issues, mm -hmm. the earlier one can start planning for that So before you get into into those issues. No, absolutely. I think we saw it in the conversation with Emma around um, you know, op operational mm. resilience. Uh, I just want to pick up on one point that you raised, uh, Andrew. You talked a little bit about relationships with funders, yep. uh, you know, communication with them, et cetera. So, so how important is it to really communicate with, uh, with your funders broader stakeholders, I suppose, as part of building um, balance sheet resilience. Yeah. Look, uh, we always talk about setting expectation being 50% of, of uh, you know, getting the right answer in, right. from a business perspective. And it sounds soft, but it's so important. Uh, I mean, and stakeholders are both internal and external. So as you mentioned, it's, you know, it's employees, it's the management board teams, it's customers and suppliers, it's your external, uh, other external uh, elements being you know, shareholders uh, and, and funders and the like. The, the reality is everyone needs to be planning for the unexpected. Right. The more regular you have interactions with them, the more that they can also prepare on their side mm -hmm. um, and build trust through that process. And you'll be surprised just how long people will be willing to go on a journey with a business as a wider stakeholder group mm -hmm. if there's, that trust has been developed uh, over time. So it's really about collaborating with all those stakeholders keeping that uh, open, honest, transparent communication on a regular basis. And one, yeah. one will see the benefits through that. And actually, we saw with COVID now, those businesses that really invested in deep relationships with mm. all the stakeholders were the ones that have been able to weather the storm a lot better because everyone's gone on the journey with them. So it's, uh, 
again, it sounds soft, but it's actually sort of one of the key critical um, elements to uh, making a business successful. And I mean, that continuous engagement is hard work. Right? Absolutely. So you've got to put the effort into it and exactly. you've got to plan uh, appropriately. Yeah, you have to carve out the time. Absolutely. And that talks to capacity and, yeah. and you know, driving. Resourcing. Exactly. The other areas that you spoke about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's it's been wonderful to to have this conversation with you. I think you've given us such insight and, and practical nuggets as well, which which hopefully our audience found very useful. Um, I think this is such a relevant series around, um, you know, building resilience, um, you know, as we discussed at the beginning, just given the current economic yeah. environment. Um, so, yeah, just thank you so much for your time and looking forward to seeing our audience join us on, on future PwC Boardroom Forum live sessions as well. Thank Perfect. You. Thanks, Tarina. Thanks.